Let's go, girls. Come on. From New York City to Los Angeles, Powered Up with Beck and Franklin is giving women of all ages permission to live the life they've always dreamed of. Why live in black and white when you can choose the brilliance of 3D and Technicolor? Each week, Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin and their high-powered guests will be here to cheer you on, to share their challenges, their successes, and what they've learned along the way. It's all about women supporting women. The stories and practical tips on sex, beauty, money, and so much more are designed to help you reconnect to the powerful woman you are. Fabulous knows no limits. Now it's time for you to expand your boundaries. Here are Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin. Hey, ladies. This is Sandra Beck, and I'm here with Linda Franklin, and this is Powered Up Talk Radio. And, Linda, I'm powered up. My voice might not be. I've had that crud or whatever it is that's going around the country. I hear it's coast to coast. We've got you covered with a cough these days. (laughs) No, that's absolutely. My husband has it. And, uh, well, you know, it's the way the weather is. One day it's like 42 degrees below zero, and the next day it's 50, and it's really hard to to get your equilibrium, know what to wear and how uh, how to keep yourself well. It is, you know, with these crazy, crazy weather swings we've had. I look at the New York weather and they're like, oh, it's minus 7, and then, oh, it's 56. And, you know, out here we've had some crazy weather too. And, you know, I just, I always go down for the count though after the holidays. I think I run myself ragged from like November 15th to about January 10th, and then I just, just die. So, um, you know, it is what it is. But I'm so happy that we get to talk about narcissists today. They are people that I just, uh, I have so much experience. I was married to one. I was surrounded by them uh, in my career in Beverly Hills. And Linda, you had to be, you probably couldn't swing a cat around Wall Street without hitting a few narcissists. Well, you know, I was thinking about this uh, this afternoon, and I wonder uh, how many of us really are narcissists but don't know that we are narcissists, because I was looking at some of the profiles, and um I know a lot of people like that, and I don't think, including myself, and I don't think we consider ourselves narcissists, but, you know, no. (laughs) Well, I think one of the biggest criteria that I found, you know, with all the psychology that I've been through with marriage counseling and counseling for my kids is that if you ask yourself, are you a narcissist? You probably aren't. Well, I... Well, then, you know, I guess that's one of the things. And I, I, oh, I think I'm on the wrong feed. Oh, let's see. Oh, well, I don't know if you can hear me. Is that better? Hello? Goals, objectives, business and action plans. How important are they for me to manage? Whether you're an executive, entrepreneur, or maybe you're just someone looking to advance your career and want to be confidently prepared for your future, business and life coach Carmen Carosa can help you remove obstacles and move forward in the right direction. Carmen is known as the real world coach for a reason. His no-nonsense style along with an innate ability to form connections with people gives you a unique opportunity to see higher and further than ever before. We live in work. Oh, you guys, you got to love technology. We had some technical difficulties, and her name is Linda Franklin. <laughs> yes, the queen of the Internet. Uh, that's me, and I think I, I touched something I wasn't supposed to touch, and, and everything went, <laughs> Well, I think that's great because it's live radio and part of being powered up is also powering through, uh, you know, the challenges that we have uh, without losing our sense of humor, our grace, and our of style. Of course. I mean, you ha- if you saw the People's Choice Awards the other night, then, you know, you know we're not alone in the world. And that was watched by, I know, millions, hundreds of millions of people when uh, Jackie Biff did got up and sort of did her ramble. So I don't feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we can just ramble away.
away because we got a whole hour uh, today to ramble away. But, you know, it's interesting that you brought up that thing about the, the traits of narcissists, Linda, because we all have aspects of ourselves that are healthy narcissism, you know, healthy characteristics. But, you know, when we deal with these narcissists, the ones that we're talking about today are the ones who are the ones that everybody talks about. They go, well, that guy's a total a-hole or she is such a monster. And, you know, they do things that the rest of us don't. You know, they don't have a problem lying. They don't have a problem cheating. A lot of times they don't have a problem stealing. They have huge, huge anger issues. I mean, you guys can go ahead and Google, you know, characteristics from, you know, on narcissism or characteristics for narcissistic personality disorder and make your own decision. But we all have, you know, some of these characteristics. Absolutely. But they're really, really overblown, you know, really overblown. When you're dealing with a narcissist, you will know it, Linda, because you'll walk away feeling like you got hit by a truck. It's, it's really that simple. Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm just looking at some of the thing on Wendy's website of the characteristics of narcissism, and, you know, it's like distrustful, demanding, um, but also perfectionist. So, I mean, listen, how many women, <laughs> you know, are perfectionists? So I think we all have a few of these traits, but that doesn't necessarily mean we are a full-blown narcissist. Sure, sure, because there's like, you know, I can give you a perfect example. You know, you can sit there and say a little white lie, you know, not to hurt anybody's feelings, or you can just tell a whopper, like, uh, what's his name? Uh, you know, who is the, the cyclist, uh, the bicyclist from... Oh, Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong. He's a classic narcissist. He lied to, you know, millions of people. He lied to his fans. He threw his best friends and his closest compatriots under the bus, you know, for, for, for himself for just to fill that, you know? Yeah, well, look at A-Rod now. I mean, that's, that's in the headlines every day about, you know, what he did and with the drugs and trying to get back into into play for the Yankees. And, yes, you know, it, and I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, too much too soon and they get so much money and, you know, they just don't think they can, they, that's it. They don't think that they can ever do anything wrong that's going to be caught. I mean, there's a lot of people on Wall Street like that. Well, it'll be an interesting chat with Wendy because I'm, she's, you know, she's seen it all. <laughs> well, yeah, and you know, and it was funny um, because the first time, you know, we went to marriage counseling, my ex-husband and I, you know, the therapist looked at me and said, you know, you're dealing with a narcissist. And I was like, oh, really? What's that? You know, and then the second one and the third one and the fourth one and the fifth one. And, you know, we went through this pattern of things and we're still dealing with it today. Because the thing about narcissists, they really think everybody else problems. It's everybody that they are really never to blame for anything. Yeah, no, uh, the, yeah, we don't like people like that because, you know, no. we know it takes two to tango and it's never just one person's fault, but they'll, but they'll never admit it because I think that their, their egos and their, uh, the way they feel about themselves, their self-image is so fragile that if they don't come off as these bombastic idiots that they're going to crumble. Right, right. Well, and it's interesting you say that because, you know, I have, I belong to a, a group of women who uh, we all get together because we were all married to narcissists that, you know, encompass lawyers, doctors, uh, celebrities. One's uh, ex-husband is a famous singer, you know, and we all get together and we talk about these things. And last week the kids were getting together playing and I said to one of the little girls, you know, she's about 11 years old, I said, what's the hardest thing that you have to deal with with your dad? And now this guy is a professional athlete. And she said, you know, Miss Sandra, my dad has to win all the time. And even when my brother and I play Monopoly, he'll trick my little brother. So he'll make a bad move. I think I lost you, Sandra. We're not having a good Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I, I lost you, yeah. No, but that, that, and, and that's so sad when you see parents competing with the children. Right, but you and I look at each other and go, that's insane. We would never do that. But you know what? A narcissist cannot lose. They cannot. And I remember towards the end of my divorce, my ex-husband smashed a Scrabble board on the kitchen table because I beat him. You know, I got a triple word score in the corner. It was a lucky draw of the tiles or whatever. It was just a game. But it was so crushing to him and that's what i saw in this little girl's face she's like 
he can't even lose to us in Monopoly. And, but, you know, those are the kind of things that you see as warning signs. Yeah, but I want to look at it from the other thing, and that's why we'll talk to Wendy about it. What is it about these people that attracted us in the first place? Because I, I don't think all of a sudden when they met uh, when they met you that, that he became a narcissist. There was something there all along. What was it originally that attracted you to to, to that or anybody to, to a, a person like that? What is it about us yeah. that it, you know, so it's a dynamics. It's, 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 you know, pretty cool. Yeah, or not. Really cool. I mean, I, well, you know, but we, we, we learn as we grow and, you know, it's like now I can spot a narcissist in the New York minute. You know, I can talk to somebody for five minutes and it's like, check, 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 check. Next, please. You know, because when you move in circles, Linda, that you and I do, we move in circles with a lot of powerful people, a lot of influential people, people with wealth and, and you know, or in my case, you know, high ranking military um, and police officials are all, you know, in my stable. And, you know, one of the things that makes these people so great is that they are successful. Successful, and they are dominant, and they are powerful, and those are really potent aphrodisiacs for a lot of us. Yeah, no, absolutely. I wonder if, um, if, if it's a, more of a male trait than a female trait, or it's even. I don't know. That's a good question to ask Wendy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm really excited to talk to her today. She is um, an author of a book called Disarming the Narcissist, and I actually read it cover to cover. I read lots of books on narcissism, but I liked her point of view because she was talking about strategies to actually deal with narcissists versus, um, you know, most people who just say, write them off, go, it's over, you know, break up with them. And that works as long as you don't have kids and you don't have to deal with them. Uh, but that's not always a reasonable solution. So I need to take us to commercial break. My name is Sandra Beck, and I'm here with Linda Franklin, and this is Powered Up Talk Radio. And when we come back from the break, we are going to welcome Wendy Vahari, the author of Disarming the Narcissist, Surviving and Thriving with the Self-Absorbed. Yes, um, but I, I think my chat is behind. I don't know if we're on break or not. I can't talk right now because I'm doing actually doing this. We've got lots more powered up with Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin after these messages. Have you ever wondered why America is facing such a health care crisis? Then join us for Dr. Peter DeVette Live every weekday at 1 p.m. Central on toginet.com. Doctor, doctor, give me the news. He'll answer your health care and medical questions and share with you his knowledge and opinions on topics ranging from holistic health care to spirituality and wellness. You'll find out about the roots of your health care challenges versus symptom management. The Holistic Approach, how the spirit, mind, and body connection is critical in both the development of illness and the solution to illness. How emotions are directly related to physical illness and how to read your body like a book. Dr. DeVette will also go through your personal questions and how you can navigate through the illness maze. Supplements, medications, therapies, treatment options, surgeries, all kinds of things related to your health. Dr. Peter DeVent Live, every weekday at 1 p.m. Central on toginet.com. It's not just time for a change, is it? It's much bigger than that. Can you feel it? It's time for a transformation. Will you now imagine that you can and will transform your life? Will you suspend your disbelief and imagine that all things are not just possible, but probable? Imagine that you will meet guides, mentors, and trusted friends who believe in you, hold your hand as they point the way, and teach you to trust your own wisdom. The first of these friends is spiritual girlfriend Gail Carruthers. Gail will show you how to believe. Believe your perfect divine wisdom will reveal your worthiness. Believe that knowing your power will open your boundless courage, 
courage to live consciously, fearlessly, and joyfully. And then know, know all these things are already here and waiting for you to bring them into your divine life. She is here to help you discover, believe, and know. So join Gail, your spiritual girlfriend, every Friday at noon Eastern Standard Time, only here on the WooHoo Radio Network. Connect with Juliana and connect with what lies beneath. Friday afternoons at 4 or 3 Central on toginet.com. Juliana is certified as a life coach who wants people to connect. Connect with what lies beneath, those truths and answers. And through her counseling practice, she has helped others find their personal power and fulfill their dreams. And she wants to do the same for you here on Connect with Juliana. Through intimate discussions, intriguing subject matters, and the expertise of her guests. For more on Juliana and her show, check out her website, connectwithjuliana.com. Juliana will cover it all. Nothing is off limits. She wants to know what matters to you. Make the connection. Tune in to TogiNet to connect with Juliana to find out the facts that could be hidden beneath the surface. Connect with Juliana on TogiNet to make a quality connection in your life. Friday afternoons at 4, 3 Central on toginet.com. We're back with Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin. Here's more Powered Up with Beck and Franklin. Hey, ladies, this is Sandra Beck, and I'm here with Linda Franklin. And from coast to coast, we've got you covered for money, sex, beauty, love. And now we've got to throw in some psychology today. Linda, you raised such a great point before we went to break. Uh, You said, what is it about narcissists that make us so attracted to them? Uh, I don't know if we have Linda. If we lost Linda, we're having crazy, crazy feed issues today. I think there might be, I don't know, Mercury might be in retrograde. But I'm going to continue talking. We have our guest today who is Wendy Bahari, and she is the author of a great book called Disarming the Narcissist, one of the few books that I actually read cover to cover, made some notes. And Wendy, uh, welcome to the show today. Thanks, Sandra. Great to be with you. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm so excited. Uh, Linda and I in the opening segment were talking a little bit about the narcissist in our life since she spent a lot of time on Wall Street and I spent a lot of time in the military and entertainment industries. Can you give us in a nutshell what makes um, what makes the difference between somebody who's truly a narcissist and, and the rest of us who have healthy narcissism? Yeah, sure. Um, a true narcissist or someone with some more moderate to severe narcissistic features is someone who is, think of a person who's just highly self-absorbed, someone who has to always have, you know, the grip on the wheel, in control, dominant, superior, off-putting, pushy, um, can be very boorish. It's as if you disappear right before their eyes. So they're seeing right through you, basically looking, you know, into your reflection to see their own face. So there's a strong, you know, there's this very strong need to be able to, you know, they enjoy the sound of their own voice, and and it's all about them. I mean, they can be very charming too, and then heroes and rescuers, but it's usually still all about them. Okay, I hope you can hear me. I'm going to ask a question. If you can't, you'll let me know. Uh, I wonder uh, how much narcissism is there in each of us that we really don't even recognize. Yeah, I can I can hear you fine. Um, did you want me to answer that? Yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think you know when you think about the life cycle, we all have certain amounts of narcissism within us. That some that are natural when we're little, as children, vulnerable little creatures, where the world revolves around us, and we look for that to you know hopefully become tamed with good caregivers. Um, adolescence is a tricky period of time, although. Again, it's it's not unusual to be more self-absorbed at that state of life. And throughout the life cycle, I think, you know, there's times when we're just a little more caught up in our own world and times when our super confidence needs to exceed our regard for others, especially when we're on a mission to try to do something that might be important or that's going to have an effect on the life of others, sometimes even on ourselves. It's just, you know, it's a matter of the balance. 
and the ability to uh, offer reciprocity. That makes the difference in healthy versus unhealthy narcissism. Well, and the one thing, you know, that you talked about and that, you know, um, that I see with the narcissism, like some people tease me and they go, oh, my God, Sam's getting Heidi. You know, she's going all dominant on us. And you're right. When you're passionate about something or it's really important or you're afraid, you know, when I get frightened, I get really controlling. Um, But at the end of the day, I never lose my empathy or my compassion for somebody. And if somebody is hurt by my actions, you know, I'm crushed. I just, you know, I never want to hurt someone. And if I see their face but yet I watch like my ex-husband and some of these other ex-husbands routinely crush their kids Mm -hmm. I can see it on their faces I can see their wives or their ex-wives or their girlfriends just crippled Mm -hmm. and they don't even see it and I I, want to talk a little bit about that Wendy because you 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 work with people like this so you know what component I'm talking about and I don't know if I'm expressing it properly but but there's just like a missing chip there yeah, that was actually a perfect differentiation that you just described, that, you know, even sometimes when we may be passionately preoccupied with something that's important to us, we still have the capacity to be empathic. We still have the capacity to be remorseful if we hurt someone, perhaps accidentally, in the process. And that's a really excellent way to define the difference between the two. I do work with, um, I work with women primarily, I work mostly with narcissistic men, so I'm often seeing, you know, their wives or ex-wives or partners or lovers who are, you know, at their wit's end, and many who are going through the rigors of difficult, acrimonious divorce and trying to co-parent with this individual, you know, right in the middle of tyranny and, and I'll show you in retaliation that's going on as a part of the divorce and the kids get caught in the middle very often. Would you say that there um, is a majority of narcissistic men versus narcissistic women or is it pretty 50-50? You know, it's a great question. It comes up very often now. I think it's probably the, the gap is starting to narrow. I think You know, we talked a lot about 75% of narcissists are men, and yet I think that probably there's a good number of women that enter the arena of narcissism. I just think that they show up a little differently. Um, And I do think that, you know, although there's some overlap, I, I still think that, you know, the male narcissist has a different level of aggression and a different level of disconnection that can be very harmful to children and families. Well, and I love that you say the difference about the aggression level, because I have a very close uh, family member uh, who's a narcissist, and she's married to a narcissist, and it's amazing to watch these two in, in uh, you know, together, you know, because you think that they repel each other, but they actually, you know, kind of, they work in some weird synergistic way, but the difference is, is like, the man is uh, is so aggressive he's gonna get her he's gonna win the fight he's gonna and then she fights back equally as aggressively but it's in such a sneaky withholding um gentle way so i think it's easier to look at the narcissist as a man because his aggressions are so overt but the women that i know who are narcissists and especially this you know family member in particular she's so sweet to everybody and she's so pretty and she is mean and evil as the day is long underneath but you'd never know it it's like you never know what you're going to get hit by this woman so when you think when you talk about that what i see is that you know that male aggression is so visible to everybody we're going to throw a chair we're going to yell at somebody we're going to you know kill them in business and then you got women who maneuver in a whole different way so i don't I, i'm going to say that you know there's a lot of women out there who are narcissists that aren't classified that way because we don't see it we just get hit by it as a like a a side swipe. Yeah, and even worse than that, many of them are martyrs, so you really don't see it because they show up as what I call in my book the virtuous victims. That, but they're, they're like the diva moms or they're the diva princesses who can be, I mean, let's face it, there's plenty of women who can show up very much like their male counterparts very overtly, but the majority of them are what you're describing, Sandra, and they're, they're more covert operations, more behind the scenes when you least expect it. <laughs> You know, I'm wondering how much a success level in one's life um, gets a person to be more narcissistic. I mean, I had a wonderful partner um, and mentor on Wall Street, and he 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 was aggressive, but he never uh, he never raised his voice. But he knew how to manipulate people 
like a master. And, you know, it was it was almost interesting to watch him because he had it was like he was a chess master. He had he had the board in front of him and he moved people around because he knew how they would react and what they would do and what was good for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's a bit of an interesting phenomenon because the question is, you know, do they become more narcissistic as they become more successful or is there something in the temperament and in the, you know, the early environment of this human being that naturally guides them to be these kind of super autonomous, successful human beings who can, I mean, they can also lose it all and squander their money and, and go bankrupt. And you don't have to you know, necessarily be rich and famous to be a narcissist because they come in all shapes and styles. But I do think that many will be successful because of that need to not need anyone, not have to you know, relegate themselves to the ordinary folks in the world. And so they have to be at the top of the top. And success is really kind of the fuel that keeps it all revved up. Well, and in some ways, you know, and I'm going to go out and say this on a limb because I get a lot of hate mail sometimes for the things I say. So we'll just add this to the list. <laughs> um, but what we love in narcissists is like, you know, the guy who puts aside everything so that he can solve cancer and he's willing to dedicate his whole life to everything. And we all think that's great. But then if you go to his wife and kids at home, they're like, my dad was never around for me. My husband, you know, didn't take care of me. He was, you know, married to his work and everything. So it's all cool for us we are the recipients of these narcissistic successes and I just my thing is I just wish they wouldn't have families yeah and you know it's I hope you won't get hate mail for that because it's a really good insight I mean we can they can put forth a lot of good stuff you know they can produce good shows good movies good cures for cancer good all kinds of things solve financial dilemmas um, they can do plenty of good for humankind it's not their, uh, you know, the gifts that we receive as a result of their brilliance that's the problem. It's their interpersonal style. It's their emotional limitations. It's their sometimes impulsive, you know, sharp, um, sarcastic or abusive behaviors that become problematic. To the people you know, Wendy, I'm sorry I got to cut you off. We got to go to commercial break. Yeah, sure. uh, our guest today is Wendy Bahari, disarming the narcissist. If you are in a relationship with a narcissist, or you think you might be, or you might be raising one, you never know. You could be a married one, they could be your parent. Disarming the narcissist with Wendy Bahari, you're wanna, gonna come back and learn more after the break. We've got lots more powered up with Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin after these messages. This is for all you girls about 42. Tossing pennies into the fountain of youth. This is Uncommon Sense for Leaders, a forum for exploring leadership from the intellect, the heart, and the spirit. Whether you're a leader now or aspire to be a leader in the future, you owe it to yourself to learn about the big ideas that have shaped the careers of compelling communicators, masters of influence, and highly effective leaders. Uncommon Sense for Leaders. Tune in to hear thought-provoking ideas on every aspect of leadership. You can expect dynamic discussions with special guests, quick tips you can apply immediately for better results, and the tools you need to take you from where you are to where you want to be as a leader. Are you ready to crack the code for achieving unprecedented results? Then join the host for Uncommon Sense for Leaders, Catherine Carlisi, every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on the All Business Radio Network. What does success mean to you? Money? Power? Fame? Having everything money can buy? Does it mean having a job or career that you love? A great family life? Or simply to be happy? If you're still searching for answers, then join us each Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern for Primetime Success Radio, where Alan Skidmore and his special guests will discuss health, finances, relationships, being in business, and how you can have a life that is not only successful, but a life of meaning. Alan has been studying success principles for over 25 years through reading, attending seminars, interviewing successful people, and a daily lesson from the School of Hard Knocks. 
and now he wants to share that information with you. So join Alan Skidmore on Primetime Success Radio every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on the Rockstar Radio Network, as he takes you on a journey of finding the heart of your success. Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin. Here's some more Powered Up with Beck and Franklin. This is for all you girls about 42. Hey, ladies, this is Sandra Beck, and I'm here with Linda Franklin, and we're halfway through our show. And for those of you who missed the first half of the show, check us out at PoweredUpTalkRadio.com. You can find our show, this show, and many other shows that deal with women in their 40s, 50s, and 60s and some of the unique challenges that they have. You can also find us on iTunes under Powered Up Talk Radio or go to our host station. We want to thank them in Texas uh, for putting us on the air, Toginet, T-O-G-I-N-E-T.com. Now, we've been visiting with Wendy Bahari, and she wrote a great book called Disarming the Narcissist, Surviving and Thriving with the Self-Absorbed. And for those of you, like me, who were in relationships, past and present, uh, with a narcissist of varying levels, you're going to want to listen to this segment because... Uh, we're going to talk about uh, couples. Like when you are in a relationship with a narcissist and you have a lot of difficulties and you go to help, get help. I hope you don't run into what I ran into, uh, Wendy. I went to four or five different marriage counselors and all of them said the same thing. We will work with you to help you end this marriage. We will move work with you to leave this relationship. We will. And they really just, I mean, I'm glad they did because it was the best thing that could ever happen to me, but they were just like, we can't help him you know we can only help you and you need to get out that was really the only option we had and that's what I liked about your book because you actually tackled that tough question is what do you do with them Mm. yeah and you know it might be that the people the professionals that you met just you know had a lot of insight into some of the key missing ingredients to make the marriage work to make a relationship work when you're dealing with a narcissist if you don't have leverage, I mean, if there are no real meaningful consequences in <clears throat> this relationship with them, something that they absolutely can't bear to lose, then treatment will never prevail. It will barely commence, but it'll never prevail. Um, if the therapist is not really skillful at dealing with those kind of moment-to-moment encounters and without getting slaughtered by the narcissist or intimidated and ending up kind of aligning with them, which is another problem, Um, So there has to be a certain skillfulness in the structure of the therapist, um, a certain realness, and there has to be leverage because without that, there's no going forward. Have you got a success story that you can relate to us of two people that came in? Um, Maybe there were two narcissists living together or one was and one wasn't, but somehow the light bulb went on and their relationship uh, got much better after working with you. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I do. There's, there's been, you know, fortunately, several, you know, more than a few who have had some success. But it, it's because of that. What I was just saying about there's something meaningful, something that we can hook into that they don't want to lose. So it might be that you know they can see the effects on a child who has become you know, very emotionally impacted by the behavior, maybe by the conflict in the relationship, but mostly by the behavior of the narcissist. It may be that, you know, the threat, the the real threat of losing this partner who has said it over and over, but now is demonstrating a real, you know, disconnect from the narcissist is very frightening. I mean, at the core, most of them are very lonely people. And although they can be vindictive in their cover-up schemes, they're very lonely. So if you can get at the that loneliness and, you know, get at something that matters to them the most, then engaging them in treatment becomes very possible. And also enlisting a partner who, you know, may be exhausted from this process, but needs to carry the torch a little longer to to lead the way to get this thing going with the help of the therapist. 
Well, and you said something. I just wrote some notes down here. I take notes during my own radio show. <laughs> um, but you said, you know, what matters most to this person. And the thing is, it's like what matters most to most of the narcissists that I know, not all of them, the ones I think there are some that can be helped. But it's that whole thing of like, if it's not about me, if it doesn't affect me, then I don't care. If it's not in it for me, it's only about me and unless it affects me. So you're talking about finding their currency, finding their trigger, finding their yeah. the one thing that they actually do care about and you gotta hope it's you <laughs> because yeah. if not you can walk out the door and another five foot eight blonde will walk in and take your place there you go exactly and you hope that it's you and you hope that you know despite the fact that they will spout all of this bravado you know i don't need anyone i don't care about anyone go ahead leave me uh, very often you know they say that because there's the security of knowing that they have you know really tattered your confidence and you're not going anywhere and then when they see you're actually heading for the door, they've either already secured a new relationship or they start to literally come unraveled because they can't tolerate, you know, the threat of the loss. Even if it just starts with embarrassment and then later becomes, you know, something that's actually more meaningful than just the humiliation of, of failure. You say that narcissists are kind of lonely and I would buy that, but don't you think they are also very insecure of... Uh, because of, you know, they have to sort of, it's emotional abuse really is, is what they are projecting on other people. Uh, yeah. Or, yeah. So that if, if, you know, if they don't do it first, it's like kill or be killed kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, I think they're very, I think that's exactly right. They're very lonely underneath and it's not lonely because there's no one in their life. They usually have affiliates or an entourage of admirers but fans they're lonely for true intimate connection because they won't let it in and so and they won't let it in because of what you just said linda which is they're so insecure they don't have the secure you know they don't have that 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 solid facility for knowing how to readily connect to people um they get bored they feel awkward they get embarrassed Many of them are actually shy deep down inside, despite their fangs that come out when they're upset. Um, they're just really awkward in the interpersonal world. You know, what's interesting to me, you know, we talk about their feelings and stuff because I, I didn't really see a whole lot of feelings with, with the person that I had this relationship with. I saw anger uh, and I saw, you know, anger. <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot of other. Um, but my question to you, Wendy, since you're so experienced is this, you know, you mentioned the word humiliation and that that's something that strikes a chord with me because not only in my experience, but the experience of my girlfriends that were all part of this group. Why do they want to humiliate us so badly? They don't want us anyway, and they don't want us to leave, but yet they want to humiliate us. Like, why is humiliation such a big part of of the the relationship with the narcissistic person? You know, whether they humiliate others or, you know. Yeah, yeah and it seems so sadistic. And yet, interestingly, you know, I know this from the treatment room of working with many of them, like the, you know, ex-husband, the ones you've described. And uh, you know, for them, it's a survival mechanism. It's, you know, I have to, it's that one-up position. I'm going to humiliate you. I'm going to put you in that one down so that I can feel superior and I can be okay. And um, it, it it gets very much motivated from this sense of feeling threatened. It's almost primitive for them. And so it does come across. I'm not, I mean, I certainly don't minimize the pain and the impact on others, but I don't think it's mostly motivated by any sadistic, you know, thinking of how can I just knock you over. It's how can I protect myself and I'll do whatever it takes to make that happen, even if I have to push you into the ground, um, because I'm going to come first. So it's back to that whole idea of complete self-absorption and trying to maintain faith at any cost. Yeah, I mean, constantly being in control, um, it's a power struggle with anybody that uh, happens to be in your path, and, and you've got to win, and it's, you know, it's got to be exhausting after a while. I wonder, I wonder, you know, what would be that button, like you said, that actually has them look at themselves to say, hey, man, I just can't live like this. It's got to take a terrible toll on your health. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's. I think very often in my experience, it's finally hearing it from someone um, who can be honest with them, who may have just enough clout 
um, in other words, an expert or someone who can say to them in a very honest way, hey, knock it off. You know, why are you talking to me like that? Which is what, that's the frame I'm in when I'm working with them in my office. Like, why are you using that tone of voice? What are you doing that for? And then they say, this is ridiculous. They get up, they start to walk out. I say, go ahead. But fast forward, your head is for a lonely road. Trust me. I know what I'm talking about. So you've got to be credible. You have to have just that that little hook that you can grab, even if it just engages them into the game of wits for a while. Eventually they will settle down because you may be the first person who really addresses this issue with them and confronts them. Yeah, it just it sounds sounds so exhausting. I can see why most therapists don't want to deal with them. <laughs> it's true. Sadly, that's true, and unfortunately, <laughs> you know, all the re- the recommendations or the referrals that I get for people to work with their narcissistic partners and not having enough therapists who will, are willing to do this is uh, very frustrating. Because there is, you know, there are ways to make it a difference, is. even it if is. just to help with them becoming better fathers after the divorce. I mean, how many of us would love for, you know, your narcissistic ex to become just a good human being and a good father so that your children can have the benefits of that relationship, you know? So even even after, you know, marriages end and relationships end, to be able to continue to keep that, that energy there for working on themselves is important. Wendy, we have just two minutes left, but for the for our audience uh, that's listening today, uh, you're a cognitive therapy, that's your, you're a therapist, that's your specialty. Can you just explain exactly what cognitive therapy is um, and how it works differently than the other traditional therapies? Yeah, I'm actually a schema therapist, which has its roots in cognitive therapy, but schema therapy is a little bit different. It goes deeper than cognitive therapy because we're looking, we're trying to get at very core life themes that have become embedded in the personality of the narcissist, for example, based on their early temperament and their early attachment or experience ruptures in their development. So it looks deeply at development, but it also looks at those themes like insecurity and defectiveness and, you know, these overcompensating strategies to try to survive that become self-defeating. It's very much like a reparenting model that tries to meet needs at a deeper level. Wendy, I want to thank you for being our guest today. You were amazing. Uh, I love your book. I suggest anybody listening today who's dealing with a narcissist, whether it's a parent, a child, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, it's called Disarming the Narcissist. You can get it on anywhere, pretty much. It's uh, put out by New Harbinger Publications. Uh, Wendy Bahari, when we come back from the break, we're going to bring on intimacy expert Michael Russer. He's going to talk about the differences in hardwiring between men and women. So you're not going to want to miss him, so come back after the break. Thanks so much, Sandra. We've got lots more Powered Up with Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin after these messages. Chances are, you didn't give birth to Einstein. So why are you trying to raise your child to be like him? Welcome to Stop Raising Einstein with your host, Tara Kennedy Klein. Woohoo Radio Network's parenting show dedicated to helping you release the myth of the perfect parent and discover the unique brilliance in your child and you. Tara and her panel of amazing, intelligent, and sometimes off-the-wall guests will share the tips, tools, trends, and techniques available that will help you stop raising Einstein and start relishing your role as a proud and present parent. Join her every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time for Stop Raising Einstein, only here on the WooHoo Radio Network. What does success mean to you? Money? Power? Fame? Having everything money can buy? Does it mean having a job or career that you love? A great family life? Or simply to be happy? 
If you're still searching for answers, then join us each Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern for Primetime Success Radio, where Alan Skidmore and his special guests will discuss health, finances, relationships, being in business, and how you can have a life that is not only successful, but a life of meaning. Alan has been studying success principles for over 25 years through reading, attending seminars, interviewing successful people, and a daily lesson from the School of Hard Knocks. And now he wants to share that information with you. So join Alan Skidmore on Primetime Success Radio every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on the Rockstar Radio Network, as he takes you on a journey of finding the heart of your success. Beck and Linda Franklin. Here's more Powered Up with Beck and Franklin. Hey ladies, this is Sandra Beck and I'm here with Linda Franklin and our guest right now is Michael Russer. He's an intimacy expert and we're going to talk a little bit about how men and women are wired. Now we just went through a whole bunch of stuff with narcissists. That guest Wendy Bahari, you can find her book Disarming the Narcissist, Surviving and Thriving with the Self-Absorbed at Amazon. We're going to switch gears right now. We're going to welcome Michael Russer and we're going to talk about the difference between men and women in their wiring. Michael, what's the difference? Uh, (laughs) Quite a bit. (laughs) I know we only have 15 minutes, but I'll try to do my best. Oh, there's all kinds of differences. And as you and Linda know, because you've had me on the show several times before, I come from a rather unique perspective. I'm a fully impotent prostate cancer survivor. And it's it's so ironic that that impotence has actually given me deep insight into these differences. And I, I think one of the biggest differences that I see is what I call the sexual response profile. And um, men, they can see a pretty woman and literally in three seconds, they're ready to go. And about three minutes later, they're done uh, if given the chance. Women, on the other hand, take far, far longer to um, ramp up, as it were, and, uh, and, and build to the point where they can experience uh, fulfilling and very, very deep uh, connecting uh, physical and emotional intimacy. That's the primary difference. I read that men have a sexual thought every 10 seconds. What do you think about that? No, I, I actually think it's about every 7.5 seconds, <laughs> uh, actually. Uh, yeah, well, see, here's the thing, Linda. You know, men are wired, uh, you know, genetically, I think, to, and it's primarily for propagation of the species, and and we are well engineered for that. Um, A man that functions properly can literally impregnate a whole harem full of women very, very quickly, and that's great for growing the species, but, you know, we've we've hopefully gone beyond that, Uh, and... So, yes, uh, when, um, you know, men think about sex a lot because it's a very powerful drive. And when they're hard, it, it, uh, it kind of takes over. Uh, and that's where, that's where the big insight came for me because though I have a very strong libido, I don't have that overwhelming urge that comes with having an erection because I simply can't have one. And that's, that's a huge difference. Okay. Yeah, I want to ask you, Michael, because like, this is the million dollar question for me. Like, what are you thinking about? Like, are you are you sitting there, you know, typing away at your desk, you know, working or some, you know, you got policemen, whatever. We got all these different jobs. When you say every second seconds, how do you get anything done? Do you, are sitting there going like, oh, boobs, boobs are cool, or wow, yeah. look at that girl. I mean, what's going on in the head with this every seven seconds or every I don't ten think seconds? It, well, I, I think it's it's not even necessarily a conscious thought. I think it's that little tingle we get down uh, in the nether regions there that, oh, yeah. And and then we push it aside and get work done. The other thing about men is that we tend to be very goal-oriented and very, um, we, we tend to be highly focused on, on uh, if, if we're working or whatever. So if when those thoughts are true, they're usually for like microseconds and like little micro thoughts and probably more at the subconscious level. But it's, you know, it's always there. And And if we're if we're not 
busy being focused, doing something productive, well, our mind wanders. And, uh, and visual stimulation is very powerful. So, you know, so we're walking down the street, we're looking at a magazine, looking at uh, the internet, whatever. It doesn't take much. You know, for women, um, I think that, well, for me anyway, I mean, I could look in a really good looking man and, and appreciate him for how beautiful he is, but I don't have, I used to call it the ache, and it's a, sort of the same thing that you were talking about, the flutter, I call it the ache, but I usually don't have that unless I'm in a particular situation or I'm with somebody that I've had um, relationship with in the past and I can, you know, sort of my mind starts to work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Again, women are very, very different that way, and they, uh, again, genetically and and uh, you know, our, the DNA is pretty much designed. Um, you know, forgive all the you know the women out there who have a career, don't have children. I totally honor that, but I mean, you know, women are the childbearing um, uh, gender of the species, and so. Uh, they, they, uh, they're not, they're, they're not going to be as indiscriminate typically as men. And so they don't have those kinds of thoughts. Um, they, they think in longer term, they think in terms of uh, deeper connection, make sure that, that, uh, the, she and the kids are taken care of. And again, I'm speaking from a genetic heritage here, not necessarily, uh, modern times. But these, these, this wiring is very deep in us. And just like the survival instinct, which causes us sometimes to react negatively and, and often inappropriately to, to outside stimulus that might seem threatening, this is, this is old wiring. And, uh, but it's still there, very, very much there. And this wiring is also promulgated by the culture. You have all the ads out there for Viagra and Cialis, and, and which, you know, just propagates the myth of what it really means to be a man for a woman. And it's all BS, but it's there. And far too many men, unfortunately, buy into it. Well, yeah, it gives them an excuse. It gives them an out. You know, when we talk about men and different men and women, you know, we're we are wired differently. But I think that deep down and, you know, I might be a romantic or a goofball, but I think we both want the same things. Absolutely. We all want deep abiding connection. And that's what I call true intimacy. When you use the term intimacy and, and, and you say that to a woman, she will usually relate that to, and you, you know, you, you two tell me if I'm right about this or not, but you usually think in terms of deep uh, connection, whether it's emotional intimacy, physical intimacy, or even, um, uh, even uh, spiritual intimacy. Men, if you ask a man, what does it mean to be intimate? What does intimacy mean to him? The first thought is going to be sex. Uh, but beneath that, I believe men and women uh, all, you know, really do strive to connect at, at some deeper level. And it's just that men in general, and I'm generalizing here, have probably a tougher time figuring out quite how to do that. I mean, I, I think it's connection too, because that is, I think at this, maybe, maybe at different times in your life, more other things are more important. But at this stage of my life, the connection is, is really the most important thing. And I think that that really is the intimacy um, that, you know, really, you know, sparks me. Yeah. And, and here's the thing, Linda, I think even the young men who you know, been taught to become so-called players where they, you know, it, it's becomes a, uh, a sport to bed down as many women as they can. I, I even think, and I got a discussion of, with another host on this one, uh, just the other day. I think that they also are looking for intimacy, but they have no clue on how to find it. So it's like they, they're doing something that feels good, gets them out of their head, but deep down inside, they're feeling this emptiness. And uh, it, it, they just, again, they, they, they're, they're not, they've never been taught quite how to access that or how to be vulnerable so they can access that. And that, that's, a, that's a big requirement to achieve that kind of intimacy. Wow. Yeah. I just think it's amazing we even get together. <laughs> yes, but when we do, it is so beautiful. It really is. I can attest to that. It's worth the effort. It really, really is. 
and I, and I think that there's, no, I think there's things for, for both men and women to learn here. And, um, and the, you know, it's, and, and we're going to talk about that. I know we're going to be doing this on a monthly basis and we're going to be talking about that in the, um, in future segments, but what men and women can do to, you know, when they do come together and make it in such a way that it's, it really sticks and, and everybody gets what they want. Everybody truly gets what they want. And I know it's possible. I'm living it. Well, Mike, I'm going to ask you, you know, I'm going to put you in the hot seat now because you for sure. years put other people in the hot seat. So I'm just I doing know. this for all your other clients that were like, it's Michael Rester's hot seat. Um, oh boy. Yes. <laughs> an aside, no one will get. Uh, but okay. Give me your best advice to women, your best advice to men on how to create an intimate relationship with each other. You got 30 seconds for men, 30 seconds for women. What's the best you got? Okay, for men, um, really strive to understand what it means to be a, what, 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 what your woman really wants and um, become as vulnerable as possible. Really open yourself up and listen and be in tune with your woman. For women, you need to step up and share with your man in a, in a sensitive and, and delicate way, but share with him exactly what it is you want, both in and out of the bedroom. I think far too many women are afraid of, quote unquote, hurting the man's feelings or even emasculating him. If it's positioned properly, that won't happen, and he will adore you that much more. We have to be vulnerable, and, and someone is, we're, we're afraid to be vulnerable because we don't want to get hurt. So, um, right. I, you know, I know, I know lots of women out there. I think society now and the, and the Internet and, you know, pornography and everything that's out there is sort of making the relationships even harder, especially for young people, because men don't know how to please a woman anymore. They think what they see on the screen or on online is what it takes. And it's so far from reality that the women are being shortchanged. And if you're young enough, you're not telling the, the guys uh, the real truth on what it takes. And they're just sort of going blindly and, and not working into good relationships. Exactly, Linda. And what happens is that the, the relationship then devolves into a, a series of frustrating settlements and eventually probably breaking a relationship down the line. And, and it's unnecessary. And you're absolutely right. Men, most men simply don't have a clue on how women really, what they really want and need in the bedroom and uh, or even outside of the bedroom in many cases. But it's, it's not that hard because here's the thing and here's the savings grace. The, one of the most important things to any man, bar none, is knowing that he can please his woman beyond anyone else. But the problem is he needs to know how to do that. That means he has to be open to her advice and she has to be vulnerable enough to share it with him out of, without being afraid to do so. Michael, I'm so excited that you're going to be with us. Uh, you're going to come here every month. You're going to teach us uh, once a month about intimacy and relationships, how to make them better. My name is Sandra Beck with Linda Franklin. This is Powered Up Talk Radio. We'll see you next week. We're so glad you joined us for Powered Up with Beck and Franklin. Sandra Beck, Los Angeles-based single mother and technology company owner, knows what it's like to be fit, funny, and fantastic in your 40s. Linda Franklin, a New Yorker with a successful